Tonight we're pleased to have Andrew Sandberg, who is uh, James Martin Fellow at the Future Humanity Institute. And uh, you've probably come across Andrew uh, by now at some point in our tour because he gives a lot of thoughts. And all of them are like, very interesting. And without further ado, uh, let's give her a clap to Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, after all, uh, by now I think you should be starting to get a bit tired of hearing me spouting off on, on random topics. So here is a one that might seem a bit uh, random, but actually has a few interesting connections between questions in philosophy of law and ethics, legal theory, and human enhancement, which is also why we actually got three offers here. So. Uh, this presentation is going to be a bit rough around the edges, uh, partially because we're not finished with the paper, actually. We do not completely know what we think yet. Uh, and also because a lot of the slide notes uh, uh, giving extra information for slides, uh, I can't read them on that one, and they were written by my co-authors. So, which means I'm going to give my interpretation of their thinking. And they couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately, so I get to say whatever I want. <laughs> Um, okay, so what do I want to talk about? Well, uh, when you start thinking about uh, the future and crime, there's a lot of really interesting possibilities showing up when you start adding technology to the mix. So obviously as we get new technology we can commit new kinds of crimes. With cars you can run over people and you can steal cars. Uh, and with computers we can do hacking of all kinds of, uh, of uh, all kinds. We have drones emerging now, and there is not much of a legal uh, system in cover of what you're allowed and not allowed to use your drones for. In fact, it might lead to a lot of very interesting questions about uh, the invasion of privacy and uh, what you're allowed to do on top of your uh, land versus your neighbor's land. And thanks to uh, big uh, multiplayer games where people actually pay real money for spaceships and uh, uh, gold coins, etc., we have the interesting forms of virtual crime. Uh, if you want to read the great book about it, uh, you should read Charles Strauss' uh, novel, Halting State, which starts with a bank robbery where some orcs and a dragon robs a bank in a multiplayer game. We're not supposed to be able to do that from a computer security standpoint, so the fact that virtual objects worth real money have disappeared is a bit of a crisis for a company, so they call the police, who already get a very weird jurisdiction question. <laughs> Yes, the Edinburgh police responsible. Well, the servers were actually located in Edinburgh, so maybe they're responsible for apprehending the dragon. Uh. Yeah, but, but I'm not going to talk about that, I'm, uh, although, although it should definitely worth a lot of very fun uh, discussion, because uh, coming up with weird future crime uh, is so fun, it's good for stories. Similarly, of course, we might be changing how law enforcement works. Uh, so the most obvious thing is uh, right now, given yeah, Robocop might be having robot guards or robot police. Uh, uh, but uh, you might also get interesting things like this little uh, example, where it turns out that in this uh, uh, city in uh, California, police is now forced to wear a little camera recording them on the job. And apparently this has led uh, to a lot of co uh, complaints dropping quite a lot, and uh, a lot of apprehension of suspects have become much more peaceful, because otherwise, it would show up on camera what the police were up to. So that's one aspect of surveillance, but you can of course turn it around in the, the British manner, put up a lot of cameras and surveil everybody all the time and stuff. And maybe that is going to make police investigations better. And you can do interesting and scary things like probability mapping, try to figure out where are crimes going to happen or who might be involved in them and then give them a stern talking to. Similarly, you might get into the courtroom, of course. We might think about, maybe we could try to use artificial intelligence to make artificial intelligence um, judges. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. However, lawyers have already realized that text mining is really useful. At least you can save a lot of money on the people doing a lot of the simple text work. Uh, there are interesting questions about brain, using brain scans to figure out what people knew or didn't knew. Or for that matter, whether they're they accountable. There have been a few cases where people <coughs> committed crimes but got free because they obviously got a brain tumor that made them do it. Other cases which are much more iffy kind of show that, yeah, there is a systematic underfunction of that part of the brain. So maybe they're slightly less morally responsible to arrest us. 
And it's very unclear what to make of this. I've written some uh, papers uh, about whether we ought to give smart drugs to, uh, to juries so they can uh, remember what was going on better and uh, then make better verdicts. And it turns out to be some interesting problems with that, mostly because nobody expects juries to be particularly good at thinking and remembering, which is exceedingly sad, uh, extremely sad. And we might even, uh, of course, try to implement sentencing in different ways. Uh, so this is a real robot guard for Korea. They're trying to sell it to the government uh, as a cheap way of patrolling around, and it even looks uh, nice and cheerful, so if you feel good about being in prison. I can totally imagine the Japanese doing an even cuter version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this talk is not going to deal with any of this stuff. I'm going to look at the punishment part, which of course leads to the interesting question, what's actually going on when thinking about punishment? So I'm borrowing here a few slides from a really good web comic, uh, which is called lawcomic.net, uh, or the Illustrated Guide to Law, which was originally called the Criminal Lawyer's Guide to Criminal Law, and then he realized that uh, he'd gone through criminal law and started expanding into other parts. It, this is something that Robert Early in the web comic, he'd become much better at drawing too, but I think it's an interesting point here. Uh, so basically, he's arguing that the state here uh, needs to deal with crime, and as he uh, explains, like a mother. And like a mother, she has to protect us from threat, uh, teach us right from wrong, and correct us whenever we ourselves do wrong. And of course, uh, if you have a normal mother, uh, you know that she has a lot of tools in her arsenal, but uh, when it comes to criminal law, unfortunately, uh, the only tool the state has is a big freaking hammer, which she hits the wrongdoers with. And then, hopefully, they will learn something from that. Uh, and the punishment in general, you can do a lot of different kinds of punishment. Uh, so the classic one is of course just inflicting pain, which is typically what hammers do. Uh, but you can of course uh, remove property in the form of uh, removing your allowance or in the case of a mother or in giving you a fine. Uh, you can do interesting things with reputations by uh, pointing out that somebody has done something wrong and telling people they care about it and uh, how they react to uh, and of course you can restrict your liberty in various ways, and in the, at least in the case of the state, of course, they can even take your life in some jurisdictions. So that's kind of what punishment, in a sense, is. There are a lot of interesting variations here, of course, and you might uh, think about what, what's common between them is actually a slight bit unclear. What's the similarity between inflicting pain versus uh, harming your reputation? Generally, it's pretty obvious punishment or thing that you, we would not normally select for ourselves. There might be some people who might like pain or might like being locked up under some circumstances, uh, but generally uh, it's not intended to make them happy. Generally, it's intended to send a very, very strong signal. So this leads to uh, this wonderful and weird field of canology, a, a part of uh, the philosophy that tries to figure out well, what is punishment about? Why are we actually doing it? <clears throat> I'm a little bit of a fan of Michel Foucault, who argued that oh, all societies actually do punishment, and then they come up afterwards with an explanation why we're doing it. I think, unfortunately, he's probably right. I'm also going to totally ignore him, uh, because uh, from an kind of analytic philosophy standpoint, it's so boring to say it's just sociology and rationalizations. And it's actually quite interesting to look at the different kinds of explanations for why we should have punishment. Um, so, the big one, at least on the other side of the Atlantic, is retribution. So, re pure revenge doesn't really work very well then as a motivation, because uh, that doesn't care about proportionality. It, um, it's not just that it, it tends to lead to a bad cycle of violence. You hit somebody and he hits you back. It's very unclear even how to put that on a moral basis. However, a lot of people have argued that if you do something wrong, you deserve a punishment. If I steal somebody's money, I deserve not just to lose that money, but get some of the bad things in return. And if I steal a lot more money, it should be harsher. Uh, so this leads to a lot of uh, deontological arguments in philosophy. Essentially, that there are various duties, and if I'm a moral person and I discover one morning that I've stolen something, it's not just that I should give it back. 
I actually should accept the punishment for it. That's the proper thing. If that's done, then justice has uh, deserved. And really important thing is this proportionality. That's where retributivists typically get uh, into trouble. Because it's not clear if I steal double the amount of money, should I be twice as long in jail? In that case, maybe some people involved in some of the, uh, the recent bank disaster would end up in jail for very, 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 very long times. <clears throat> but in practice, this is not how things work. Similarly, how much worse is it to uh, hit somebody than to steal the watch? <clears throat> Again, it's very hard to tell. We can generally say, yeah, it's worse to actually harm somebody or inflict pain, generally, than stealing stuff. So there seems to be a lexical ordering, but it's a bit unclear how much worse it is. So if you want to put people in prison or fines, the length theory is a bit in the fine. Which means that the people who think that the retributivist theory is so stupid are gloating and having wrong fun about this. Another approach is, of course, censure actually showing that uh, this is wrong and that showing it very loudly by having a public trial where you're in the, 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 you demonstrate what society thinks is right and what society thinks is wrong and uh, to some extent also ex get the people involved to recognize what was wrong. If you committed a crime and you didn't know it was a crime or didn't feel it was a crime, if censure works well, in that case afterwards you would understand that what I did was wrong, I should feel bad. So this is one uh, set of aims, but of course people have been coming up with more. So another approach, which is kind of famous, is over deterrence. Let's scare people from doing this again. So the idea is uh, that um, even uh, the, uh, the punishment is so harsh that people will say, no, 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 I'm not going to do anything like that because I don't want to end up in jail or killed or uh, lose my money or something. And, uh, there might be also be the idea that, yeah, we should make sure that on average it doesn't pay to rob banks. It's actually fairly true in the case of bank robbery. If you look at the statistics of how much money bank robbers generally manage to get away with versus how often they're apprehended, and then calculate the amount of time uh, between bank robberies, it turns out that they're essentially a below minimum wage. It actually doesn't pay to rob banks. <laughs> But there are probably other crimes that do pay pretty handsomely. <coughs> and the real problem with deterrence is that it probably doesn't work that well, because uh, it doesn't work against crimes of passion, or when people are drunk, or stupid, or anything. Uh, and generally, when thinking about uh, doing a crime, well, most people don't think very much before doing the crime in the first place. The kind of people who end up being criminals are not the most reflective people. In fact, the the kind of people who tend to be strongly affected by deterrence are people like us who are kind of intellectual and like to think about things and uh, look at future scenarios. But in most cases we don't need deterrence either. The reason is that we're not really scared about ending up in prison. We just think, I don't, I'm not that kind of person. I do not want to do wrong. Of course, why it, something is wrong, we might have very complicated personal views on, and uh, depending on how much philosophy the lectures you listen to or how much your mother scolded you, you might have a very different approach to how your moral system works. But generally, deterrence actually is surprisingly weak as a reason for punishment. There are even some empirical data on this. Uh, so it turns out that uh, the size of the punishment doesn't have much effect at all on the number of crimes that happen. What really affects uh, the number of crimes is uh, uh, how likely you are in getting caught. If you're absolutely certain of getting caught, even if the punishment is really a slap on the wrist, people generally don't commit a crime. This leads to a bit of a bizarre situation. I have an um, office overlooking a street that sometimes has a bit of rough people around, and I remember an interesting quarrel between two people coming out from a pub about which alleyway to go into in order to have a brawl. They couldn't have a brawl in the street because there is a security camera. But <clears throat> one of the alleyways was possible to have two shots. And of course, since they didn't really want to have a brawl, they just spent uh, 45 minutes arguing about which alleyway to go into uh, to have a brawl. <laughs> which shows that even many drunk people internalize a lot of uh, these relatively rational rules. Uh, another interesting form is incapacitation. Uh, actually, removing the criminal from society. Uh, the classic thing would be lock up dangerous people until they're no longer dangerous. So, in, in some society, you have exile. 
Uh, and of course, in some society, well, some people might be too dangerous to live, Let, let's kill them off. Um, now, you might of course do it also by making locks better or adding security cameras, but the general idea is the, the reason for the punishment is not that we actually care much about the person getting punished, it's that we don't want the crime to happen again. So, then, of course, we have a, a bit more warm and fussy reasons to do punishment. Reform and rehabilitation, which is essentially based on, okay, uh, you've done something wrong, let's fix you so you don't do it again, and uh, maybe uh, you become a productive and nice part of society. So this can be viewed as fixing the character flaws. And the classic idea was put people in a prison or, in a, uh, or in a bad situation so they can think about what they did wrong, and then gradually kind of get refined morally, and uh, then uh, they're going to be good citizens again. A more modern view might be, yeah, a lot of people in prison, they're actually having a, a, a attention deficit disorder, they come from bad social uh, circumstances, many of them lack essential skills to actually get an honest job. Fix that and they're probably going to behave themselves better. So that's the general idea, uh, trying to rehabilitate them essentially. Another one uh, is restoration actually. Well, if you do something wrong, you owe somebody either your victim or maybe society at large, uh, something. So you should repay the debt, either a moral debt or quite often a monetary debt. And again, the point is uh, you want to reintegrate somebody into society. So anarchists, it's a very kind of big, very big on this idea of uh, restoration, uh, because uh, in a sense, a crime from their perspective is uh, not so much an individual thing, but it's actually a relationship between you and your society. All right, these are kind of six of the major theories. There are a few others, uh, but uh, I, don't, I won't get into them too much. Uh, okay, now we have transformative technologies. I think most of you are kind of familiar with the kind of stuff I tend to be interested in. So this slide should be absolutely unsurprising. Uh, a lot of cool and awesome technologies are on the way. Some of them might uh, change the human condition quite a lot. Some of them are at least going to allow us to do interesting things. Um, now, this raises a lot of very fun questions uh, for um, uh, penology. And this is the reason for the talk, of course. Uh, so generally, the penal quantum, which sounds awesome, it's kind of weird physics here, uh, how much punishment is appropriate for a given crime? That might actually depend on what kind of technology you have. Uh, there is the question about individualization. How much should they punish somebody depending on who we are? Right now in legal situations, uh, so you sometimes take uh, who people are into account in sentencing. For example, if somebody has dependents, it's generally regarded as a kind of bad idea to give them a long prison sentence because that's going to affect their children and wife or two. Uh, but you might think about other aspects. Maybe if you could scan the brain and actually check, is this guy ever going to become a nice citizen or is he always going to be a nasty sociopath? If we could reliably do that, should we actually change our rules to actually include that brain scan? Uh, also, of course, we can, uh, as we learn more and more how to read brains in various ways, how much should we actually care about the mother of Everest emotions? Especially if you think that, hmm, the point is he's, he should learn what he did wrong. And if you, at that moment, a little clock goes on, bing, now you can let him out. Well, that of course leads to an interesting question whether that's even a good idea. And this is going to be very different depending on what theory of punishment you like. Uh, there are other interesting things, uh, like what kind of technologies uh, should the offenders be allowed to use? Because some of these technologies are going to be really well integrated with your body or with your lifestyle. And that might mean that not allowing people to use them in prison or when being punished might actually make things much worse. Also, there are new pe uh, uh, penal methods we might imagine. And where do, the, do we draw the line here? Which ones are inhumane? And uh, th this leads to a lot of very fun problems. Uh, so we're going to kind of look at some of these penal uh, systems and how they intersect with some of these uh, technologies. We, we cannot cover everything, uh, which is a bit sad, but uh, there's a limited amount of time here and a limited amount of pages in the paper. Uh, so, it seems like when we change technology, punishment might change in interesting ways. So, some technologies might actually enhance punishment or make it easier to do certain punishment. 
Others might turn out to undermine a punishment we're interested in. And sometimes we might make things actually worse. The technology develops, and uh, you know, the reason uh, is, of course, the normal reason we develop technology, but it might make, for example, prisons much worse. As well as, of course, some possibility for really weird crimes. Um, well, here are some technologies that kind of along the lines I'm thinking of. I'm not going to deal with all of them, but some of them allow you to do really interesting, weird stuff like mind uploading. After all, you can fast forward the prisoner. Uh, and what about the mind mapping when somebody makes in a pirated copies of other people's minds? But we're going to be slightly more focused on the free kinds of uh, uh, technologies that look like they're causing interesting stuff. So the lifespan enhancement uh, thing, this is what actually started this whole little project. So Rebecca, she, she's a mother, and she was just reading one morning uh, the newspaper about the sentencing of a criminal who killed uh, some children, and he got, I think he got 400 years of prison. And she felt that was too short. That kind of guy deserves much more. And then, of course, in the afternoon, when she was blogging about this on the ethics blog, uh, she, been, uh, she was suffering from the normal malady of philosophers. You start thinking about it. Actually, <laughs> what happens with prison sentences as people uh, can live longer? If we get good life extension, what should that do, uh, do with prison, uh, prison sentences? Um, so if we think about it, if we suddenly got an immortality pill, a 400-year prison sentence would actually work as a 400-year prison sentence. Right now, it's a life sentence. But uh, in this case, it would change to a very long one, but still a finite sentence. Now, this is fun because the retributivists, they would argue that certain crimes deserve 400 years of prison. It's just that prisoners cheat uh, by dying of old age before that happens. So if you could get life extension, fine. We're actually going to get more act proportional punishment here. Assuming the judge knows what he's doing and uh, sentences people to correct proportionality, things have gone much better. Now, if we think about uh, questions of um, uh, incapacitation, things get a bit uh, stranger. Uh, so if somebody is dangerous and is getting sentenced to 400 years of prison, he's out of society for uh, a long while, and, well, actually permanently, because he's going to die from uh, old age. But if he's getting out in 400 years' time, and let's assume that he's incurably nasty, then he's just getting back much later. Uh, so from an incapacitation perspective, things might have gotten slightly worse. Uh, it's still not that bad, because even if you believe in the incapacitation view, most people tend to really not like to give life sentences to nasty people, because we do make mistakes in the legal system all the time, and kind of dangerous to just uh, go for the harshest possible one. So they, they try to sneak out of it and do a little bit of balance, so you get a finite uh, punishment, although we suspect that you uh, ought to be back in prison for a long time. This is very uh, different, of course, from uh, finding that somebody is just crazy and that they should be uh, put in a mental hospital. Which generally, uh, if you want to minimize uh, your <coughs> the time you're locked up, is a bad thing. Because uh, generally people who get uh, locked up in a mental hospital tend to be locked up for a much longer time than a prison. So a reason of insanity is not that uh, good thing to aim for. <coughs> now if we want uh, to think uh, about the symbolic aspect, it's also kind of weird. Uh, sometimes sentences have a, a length that you are set by some rules in a slightly arbitrary way. So one, I think the longest prison sentence ever uh, 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 done by a judge was 41,000 years. And that was for um, uh, somebody working for the Spanish post office. Uh, this was apparently during the Franco year, so they were really harsh on civil servants uh, skimping the job. So he was apparently throwing away a lot of letters. And he got a sentence of a few months for every letter he had thrown away. That was the rule, and let's implement it strictly. So, and this was apparently completely linear in the number of letters, so 41,000 years long sentence. Now, we might argue that at that point in time, maybe it was sensible to regard it as a life sentence, but it's a bit unclear whether we actually felt that, yeah, 
he's going to be in there until uh, well into the, in the end of the next ice age. Uh, so you might argue that maybe we should actually, as people live uh, uh, longer, change the length of a standard sentence. Um, I did a little look at the Swedish system about it, and historically, uh, in the Middle Ages, the standard thing was either you paid a fine or you lost your head. There was very little in between. The main reason for this, and this is uh, apparently fairly typical for most of Europe, was simply that running a prison is actually it's expensive and it's actually tough to do the administration around it. So as societies developed and become richer and had better bureaucracy to handle it, prisons began to expand and prisons had actually began to make sense. But going back to the earliest uh, laws dealing with uh, standard scales of prison for murder and robbery, the typical sentence was uh, life imprisonment. It was kind of death for life imprisonment or pay, uh, pay money. And then over time, uh, these uh, life sentences uh, got turning well, either life sentence or uh, uh, 40 years or 20 years. And gradually they seem to have shortened that. Of course, in Sweden, most life sentences are actually, in practice, something like 20 years, uh, but you better behave yourself really well. Uh, and uh, many of the other uh, uh, sentences have become shorter. Meanwhile, of course, the average lifespan has gone way up. So you might argue that the time spent in prison by a criminal as a proportion of his life has gone way down. Maybe this is accurate. Maybe our societies today are so awesome that being outside uh, our modern society might be a worse punishment than in the Middle Ages. Maybe being in, in a locked up in the mid, uh, Middle Age prison versus just having to work as a serf on the fields outside, the difference wasn't so, so big. I don't think this works as an explanation at all, but it's kind of mildly amusing thought. And uh, one obvious thing uh, that I, at least I can totally imagine in some American Republican politician argument, maybe we should withhold uh, life extension uh, for prisoners. Yeah, maybe that's just for uh, the, the honest, upstanding citizens outside the prison. However, this would probably be very hard on humanitarian grounds. Uh, in fact, uh, American prisoners do have health insurance, a pretty good one. There was an interesting case a few years back when a guy was on the waiting list for a liver transplant and uh, unfortunately for him he was paroled before getting the transplant and now he was no longer eligible to get it and apparently he managed to commit a crime, get back into prison and then get his liver, life-saving liver transplant. Uh, similarly, it turns out that a surprising number of uh, uh, prisoners in America have pacemakers. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, there is an interesting problem because the American prison population is so large uh, that we're getting quite a lot of elderly prisoners. We need the Alzheimer's wards of the prison. So again, the healthcare costs in the prison system are going up. And it seems unlikely that you could say, yeah, you're not going to get that kind of treatment. Because life extension, after all, is health extension, it's life-saving. It would probably be regarded as inhumane in the court if you actually said that you're not going to give at least a proper standard of care. Yes, the first years after the mortality pill or anti-aging therapy arrives, it's pretty likely that it's going to be expensive and not on the general healthcare system, but I think it's pretty likely that eventually it's going to end up there. So this one is probably not an option at all, although it of course makes for good science fiction stories. Uh, of course, another interesting thing is, if you could spend uh, 41,000 years in prison, maybe you have time to finally figure out what you did wrong. Maybe there are some people who will eventually, uh, it's going to take a really long time to figure it out. Uh, whether this is actually a good argument or not, I'm not certain, but it's a kind of interesting aspect. Uh, but generally it looks like we're getting really nasty proportionality problems here. Especially since this might, uh, the life extension might of course be developed after a judge sentenced somebody to a life imprisonment. While thinking that, yeah, he deserved to spend uh, the next 40 years in prison. But now it turns into an indefinite, infinite uh, punishment instead. There is of course also a great deal of empirical uncertainty here. If life uh, spans are increasing, but we don't know whether we're going to get that uh, life extension or not, what is the judge supposed to do? Is he supposed to kind of get um, uh, statistics or interview leading anti-aging researchers about the optimal length of uh, prison sentences? And even worse, from a philosophical standpoint, if you, if you were to spend 41,000 years in prison, it's very unclear that the person leaving the prison is the same as entered it. 
the, the reason for this is, of course, that we change across life. And I have an identity stretching back to my childhood, but if that little boy were to stand here, he would be very confused because first he wouldn't understand English, and he would probably find the philosophical theories about prison utterly boring and uninteresting and not see any point in listening to this. We have very little things in common, a bit of biological continuity, a bit of similarities in a way of thinking. Now, if I'm around in a hundred years' time, I'm very likely to have changed quite a lot. I would need to use biomedical enhancement to stave off aging and uh, function, and I would most likely have upgraded me as much as I possibly could. That Anders would probably find me rather amusingly stupid. Uh, the, oh yes, uh, he believed those things in those days. And that's probably just over a span of a century. So we might actually end up with the situation that our continuity of personality might be very problematic over long spans of time. It's essentially that we turn into a sequence of persons. There is a gradual transition from one to another. In each of these persons is kind of glad to evolve and develop into the next one. But the final one and the first one are very different. Now, if we think that people deserve to be in a prison because they have committed a crime, that's tied to the first person, the criminal person. The person that exists a thousand years later might actually have very little in common with the criminal person. It would, he would have been uh, surrounded by a very different environment, he would be thinking very different thoughts. It's not clear from a moral standpoint that we have a right to hold him in prison because he might actually be innocent. It was just that his kind of mental ancestor was a nasty guy. So this leads to rather found problems. Uh, for m most of these uh, the theories, of course, the rehabilitation uh, theory would, of course, argue, yeah, but as long as that's a nice guy, we should actually let him out. But then we need a reliable way of checking that people actually turn into a nice guy. All right, mm, what's, uh, what more? Yeah, we had more of uh, these aspects that it might become disproportionate, and uh, yeah, we might simply need to review what a life sentence is supposed to be. Uh, then, of course, you might have fun with virtual prisons. I noticed with, with uh, some amusement that you can buy prison cell furniture for your second life environment. So if you want to have a prison uh, in your home uh, virtual reality, you can probably get it. Uh, I don't think virtual prisons actually uh, pose any particular problem, except that yeah, connecting people to a virtual reality instead of having them in a spatial prison is probably more expensive and less effective. Another thing that I don't have the time to get into, but it's kind of just funny, so called demolition man, the idea that well, let's just freeze the prisoners and put them into the future. If you have seen the movie, you notice that there is actually a rehabilitation aspect of this. Why being frozen? Somehow, magically, they're also kind of being given training to become useful uh, citizens. So Sylvester Stallone ends up being very good at knitting. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's not a great movie, but it has some fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so the interesting thing about this, and the reason I brought in the slide, besides uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone looks good, is of course the fact that it has this time teleportation aspect, which I find interesting. Uh, time plays a very important role in uh, sentencing. The, the idea that, yeah, spending a lot of time with impaired uh, freedom, that's bad. <laughs> because you're losing something over a long period of time. But also it moves you from having access to society now in the present into the future. So you could imagine if you could just fast forward or teleport people in time, would that be a good punishment? And most people would probably say no. No chance of rehabilitation. You only get incapacitation. But a lot of people say it's also unfair. The punishment needs to be painful in some sense. So in a way, actually, this kind of freezing thing really doesn't work as a punishment. Also, it turns out to, of course, be amazingly stupid in the movie, but that's kind of for movie logic reasons. Yeah. Um, similarly, of course, if you have uploaded people, you can actually fast forward and run them on a very fast computer, and they can get a thousand year punishment in an afternoon. But again, if you've done a crime against somebody, they might not like uh, meeting you the same <laughs> afternoon, and now you say, oh, I'm totally reformed, I've been contemplating what I did against you for hundreds of years, and now I've changed my mind. Unfortunately, he hasn't changed his mind. So that also seemed to have a bit of a problem. Okay, implants. This is uh, the, the stuff I'm kind of interested in. So generally, the future is likely that we're going to have implants. Indeed, a lot of uh, American prisoners do have pacemakers, and Generally, when you go to prison, 
uh, your personal possession get removed. This is part of the punishment. We like having our stuff. Uh, and uh, a lot of dynamics in prison is about people desperately clinging to the few things that are their possessions. Looking at the UK codes, uh, it's also very clear that there are some things people are allowed to have in prison and some things that you're not allowed to remove, like religious books. Uh, so if you happen to uh, uh, find that you're going to prison, you might want to de declare a suitable religion so you, in your favorite textbook or your favorite book uh, is uh, religious. Uh, this le leads uh, to interesting uh, problems if you think about enhancement. Um, so if I have a computer in my skull, oops, uh, am I, uh, or the prison authority is allowed to remove that. And this seems to breach bodily integrity. And that seems to be a surprisingly tough uh, challenge. So at least in American and English law, which is all the ones I've been checking most, it turns out that removing evidence from people's bodies against the will that's simply not done. So there have been several cases where uh, a bullet uh, in a shootout has ended up inside the somebody. It could relatively easily and safely be removed with no pain and very little inconvenience. But courts have generally found that no, uh, taking out something from under the skin of people, uh, that breaches uh, their bodily autonomy too much. We, and you can't do that. Even though it might lead to a murder and go for free. So by the same uh, line, it seems likely that if you actually have implants or something that becomes a part of your body, it might not be legally possible to remove that. I think what would be required uh, for an uh, authority is to say that, okay, yeah, that computer is going out, is if it's actually an active security threat, for example, if I'm using it to contract, control my crime network uh, wirelessly, uh, or maybe it's a, a security risk, maybe I've got a laser in my fingertip. Uh, yeah, so in that case, uh, there is kind of a, both an ethical and legal reason that might work. But quite a lot of other enhancements are probably not possible to remove uh, uh, given our current legal views. Uh, and actually, we might depend on them to function as a person. If I were to have a computer in my head, uh, I'm probably going to be more uh, dependent on that than I'm dependent on my laptop and my smartphone. And that's already a rather se serious dependence. Uh, so this is from a science fiction uh, story by Charles Sheffield, but I think most of us probably more or less recognize this. Uh, oh, losing our internet connection. Losing our calendar, oh no, what will I do? And it might be that as we develop this, they actually become so well integrated in our thought processes that our thought process will be deranged by removing them. I remember being in Beijing a few years back when uh, the Chinese government was still censoring Wikipedia. Well, maybe they were still doing it, I haven't checked. But in any case, at that point, there was an interesting little page with a rather cute uh, little police girl showing up every time I tried to access it. So it was very obvious that I was trying to access a page I was not supposed to access. And suddenly I started noticing how often I was uh, looking up stuff on Wikipedia without noticing. Now, if you subscribe to David Chalmers and Andy Clark's view of extended mind, this would uh, suggest to you that Wikipedia should be regarded as part of my memory. Essentially, if uh, we, something outside us is participating in our cognitive processes, just like, in a, uh, and we would have called that a mental process if it had been happening inside my brain, then we should probably call it a cognitive process outside too. So Wikipedia and a lot of my software should actually regard as part of my mind. It's just that they happen to exist on servers and out in the cloud, separate from me. Now, removing my access to that would remove my access to a part of my mind. I don't think this argument would work very well currently in a court. But I think it might work in a few years. So there have been a few interesting cases where typically as uh, part of a probation uh, program, uh, people have been banned from uh, using computers or accessing the internet. So Kevin Mitch Mitnick, uh, the, the hacker, he's kind of the most famous example. So when he was freed from jail somewhere back in the 90s, uh, his probation uh, rules uh, forbade him from accessing computers and internet. And more recently, Cosmo the God, uh, who is, was part of Anonymous, uh, he was also banned from using the internet without supervision and uh, only for educational purposes. Essentially, if he wants to access a web page, he needs to submit it to his probation officer and, uh, who needs to look over his shoulder while he accesses that web page. Now, these cases have actually not been up and very long. 
Kevin Mitchell got his one overturned in the early 2000s simply because it was blocking his ability to live a normal life very well. And the Cosmo God is probably going to have a tough time, for example, buying a ticket at the railway station. He's accessing a computer there. Unless there is somebody at the teller, he needs to access a computer, although it's a simple kiosk computer. I think it would be a violation of his parole. Um, so back in the 80s, if somebody banned you from using a computer, that would have limited your ability to go into some higher education or a few jobs. But it wouldn't have actually blocked you from most of society. In the 90s, it would have been really cumbersome because computers are everywhere. N lacking internet access in the 90s, that wouldn't have been that much of a cumbersome. But over the past uh, 15 years, of course, it's gone and become rather essential. You actually can't do a lot of things unless uh, you have internet access. Uh, so we might see that situation that some enhancement might simply become so integrated in our ability to function in society or function as a person that removing them, no, that would be uh, too much. Uh, you might of course argue that this could be used as a punishment actually, it's, but it would be almost a corporeal punishment. Losing your web uh, access, uh, that might be uh, regarded as too harsh. Maybe slowing, throttling your bandwidth might be uh, a more effective punishment. Yeah, you can still get information, but you're, it's going to be painful. <laughs> um, another possibility that most people will immediately start thinking about is, well, could we implant stuff and use that to produce punishments? So the, the, the most clear example would be to mark criminals with uh, radio frequency ID tags. So that way you could detect them. So this would be a bit like kind of a scarlet letter. You mark them, but only people with the right uh, radio antenna can detect them. Uh, so it might be regarded, it's not public shaming, it's just shaming to the people with the right equipment. Uh, however, it also leads to interesting questions again about bodily integrity. And uh, there have been quite a lot of discussions about using these tags, for example, on Alzheimer patients, where it might be very useful to track them down when they wander off. Uh, there have been some real cases where probation restrictions actually had added medicine since then. So you have these uh, depot devices that slowly exude a medication. And there have been some, uh, for example, contraceptive uh, systems like that that have been used in some uh, crimes. That uh, has led to a lot of interesting uh, court cases and quite an extensive ethics literature. And many people are rather uneasy about it. Uh, sometimes, of course, you might just, uh, if people voluntarily want to have it as a part of a probation, that might be all right. Doing it involuntarily probably breaches, again, a lot of body autonomy things. Then, of course, we might uh, think about, well, what about an uh, implant that gives you pain or uh, tells you that you shouldn't be doing something? Uh, so here is an interesting example, which is not so much punishment as good cattle management. So this might transform the Midwest. It's the, the, the Berkshire paddock. So instead of having a physical fence surrounding the cows in the field, uh, there is this little device that detects where the cow is. And when it's approaching uh, the pink zone, it beeps a little bit. And then it beeps a bit more insistently as the cow approaches uh, the virtual fence. And then it uh, gives it a bit of an electric shock. And then it gives it a more serious electric shock if it's outside. Uh, and this apparently works well, at least according to these maps where the cows actually are moving around rather nicely. Uh, they uh, quickly learn, uh, of course, in classic Pavlovian uh, conditioning, uh, what the beep means. The system even detects whether they're approaching or le uh, leaving the area, so it doesn't give them shocks uh, when they're actually trying to get away. Which presumably means that a moonwalking cow <laughs> could get up. <laughs> I don't think it's likely, but it could happen. Uh, now, you can imagine, of course, using exactly the same thing on humans. Uh, right now, people are having these ankle things uh, that detect where we're going, and the sounds an alarm if we're not where we're supposed to be. And this is regarded as a pretty good uh, way of uh, uh, both getting people who actually haven't done enough to deserve to be a real prison, uh, and uh, allow them to actually be having a fairly normal life, so they get to reintegrate in society. Um, but you could, of course, add this function, so if you're getting close to our pub, beep. And if you uh, try to get inside the pub, then you get the shock. Uh, and so you could, in theory, add quite complex uh, probation conditions. Yeah. Um, so on the left-hand side, yeah. the graph 
It shows it in the red. It shows the, uh, the cows beginning or when they were locating. I don't know what the difference is here. Oh, it says it says beginning on 25th of February, yeah, 2004, and it says ending on 5th of March, yeah, uh, on 2004. But they added two extra cows. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't Have know. Babies? No. Oh, okay. Sure. So this is cow, okay. So this is cow four thousand one hundred thirty. And this is cow four thousand one hundred thirty-two. So it's where they were located. It's one cow and his or her wanderers. All oh, right. It's just one cow. That's yeah. Uh, and the one interesting thing this system has is uh, not all cows get it. So apparently some cows uh, may simply don't get this and don't function. So that, that's another interesting aspect, of course. Uh, the hand to brace it as an alternative uh, to going to prison. That works fairly well for most people. Not all people. In Sweden, for example, there is a new law that says that you can use this as a punishment for stalking. So it's a very nice way of uh, making sure people who uh, believe uh, falsely that they're married with the queen or so keep them away from royal palace and so on. The problem is the normal use of hand to brace to keep, uh, keep people in uh, non custodial cells is that. People are interested in not going to prison, they want to follow the probation rules because we're essentially rational. Stalkers are not exactly rational about it. So actually making an ankle bracelet that you can't tap with it turns out to be really hard. Which is why this uh, sentence actually hasn't been used in Sweden because nobody has solved the technical problem. And indeed, uh, some of these systems do have interesting problems. So apparently, the UK system, you have a kind of formatting thing. It needs to know the location uh, where you are allowed to be. So there was apparently some teenager who got uh, this kind of sentence, and he uh, had to uh, walk around the uh, his house so the system could know where it was. Him, being a bright guy, ran around the block. So now we could be across the whole block, and it took several months before anybody realized that, wait a minute, he could be roaming uh, quite far away. Uh, so building systems that actually work and make sense, not easy. And not everybody uh, are fit for it. Of course, when it comes to cattle, uh, the, the guys behind this system point out, well, the other ones you can just put in a paddock with a fence, or maybe make a uh, sausage out of them. We can't do that with the prisoners. <laughs> Yeah, of course, uh, thinking about this conditioning thing, if uh, you, you're of a bit of a mind control bent, you, you might want to uh, go a bit further. And again, keeping to the, the bovine theme, here is a classic example in neuroscience uh, and marketing and uh, uh, how to perhaps not do marketing of your research. José Delgado uh, uh, is a Spanish-American uh, researcher who was a pioneer of putting electrodes into brains. Uh, so he demonstrated that he could control the aggression system and he took a bull, implanted it, dressed up as a matador with a remote control and then he invited a lot of journalists, and this was again in Spain during the Franco era, uh, and um, uh, invited them and the bull came charging and he pressed his remote control and the bull got all uh, uninterested and nosed around and, and he pressed another button and it was a roaring bull again and he could turn it off. Now, from a marketing standpoint, this is amazing, and it's also amazingly stupid. After all, bullfighting is the national sport of Spain, and uh, José is making a mockery of it. It's also downright creepy, of course, and uh, things didn't get better, but he actually wrote a book where he argued that we should neurocivilize our society. After all, we have a lot of nasty impulses. Wouldn't it be good if we fixed them a little bit? Uh, so if you search for his name, you're also going to get uh, essentially all paranoid schizophrenics of the internet who all claim to have an implant based on his research. Uh, but in theory you could uh, do it, and uh, it would be possible to control various aggressive impulses. It's just that, yeah, breaching bodily autonomy is rather serious. In this case, it's not just bodily autonomy. You're really messing up the motivational system of people here. So it seems exceedingly unlikely that this would be regarded as uh, allowable under any Western uh, legal system because they're mostly based on the idea that you're responsible for what you're doing. Yes, the government might lock you up, but you're actually supposed to be a moral agent even when you're locked up. If somebody can actually regulate your emotions, you're no longer a proper moral agent. You're essentially the puppet of whoever got the remote control. So that makes it very unlikely that this could be regarded as uh, useful as punishment. It makes for great science fiction, though, of course. And the hard part uh, is, of course, that we might uh, think about milder forms. What about something that helps you getting over an addiction? 
oh, I might want to have uh, something that reduce my motivation to buy fatty food. I uh, might uh, benefit, I uh, might say that that's agreeable. And uh, there are intermediate forms, just like uh, instead of prisons, uh, you might want to have a, an ankle bracelet. Maybe there might be some milder forms that we might be getting in the future. But we're going to keep the emphasis rather busy. Um, so, in general, I think I, have, I, have, I, I think I need to hurry up here, but uh, generally uh, it seems like it has some interesting possibilities uh, in the implant world. Uh, you might uh, get some implants that again change personal identity, so you might argue that the unenhanced person committed crime, the enhanced one is uh, not morally the same, but I think that's not going to work well in court. Uh, the final part, I'm going to skip through rather, uh, rather a lot. Uh, this is because we, Hannah wrote this, and I'm not that well versed with the literature. But this is about the emotional enhancement, of especially remorse. Uh, so generally, we think that it's a good thing that people feel guilty and remorseful when they do something actually wrong. Um, and uh, empathy is kind of uh, useful. People lacking empathy uh, might do a lot of bad things, and they would probably be better people if they had a bit more empathy. No guarantee, of course. There are uh, some uh, sociopaths who have great empathy. It's just that they don't care about you. <laughs> yes, but we know exactly how you feel, so we know what to push. So you might think about uh, psychopaths. Uh, what, what about them? Could you actually normalize the uh, emotional responses? So uh, it turns out that there is a lot of people trying to do the neuroscience of sociopaths. This is slightly tricky, of course, uh, because most of the sociopaths you can do research on, they're in prison and they're not there voluntarily, so you get a lot of research ethics problems. Besides the fact that they're also kind of motivated to lie to you, etc. There are a lot of methodological problems here. Uh, but also this problem of, well, can you even say that they should be punished? In a sense, they're sick. Their, their brains don't work as we, uh, we think they should. Uh, the interesting thing is, of course, suppose we emotionally enhanced one of them, so now that he can understand what he did. That would probably be rather painful. It would probably be a punishment. But we would normally frame that as treating somebody for a condition. And it's not intended to be painful if we do a treatment. So if we could help... Uh, so in the treatment view, if I, uh, we should probably be giving him some uh, cal calming drugs so he can handle his remorse. From a punishment perspective, this is kind of crazy. Wait a minute, the remorse is a good thing. He should be feeling bad because he ought to. So this leads to an interesting complication that you have this collision between rehabilitation views that says, oh yeah, please cure them, but it's not really a punishment. And uh, retribution that says, oh, it would be really good to cure them so he can actually become a, uh, a, a, a feel the pain. And of course, others might say that uh, the feeling the pain uh, that enables the bond to the rest of society. Uh, so again, uh, yeah, I've been dealing with this one. <coughs> and uh, uh, let's see. So here, of course, we get into these subtle things about what is repentance. Uh, how, how do you know what kind of repentance is good? Because again, if I'm feeling bad about something, if that's because somebody's pressing a remote control versus I realize that's not what I believe in morally. That's very different. Again, we want autonomy uh, that uh, goes with it. So one problem with giving emotional enhancement to prisoners is that they might actually not get, be get, getting the right kind of guilt. And uh, well, I, I'm just going to run, run through this one because I'm not very good at it. So, um, and of course, uh, the real extreme case might be that we succeed too well and make people too happy. So, uh, uh, to kind of conclude my overview here, <clears throat> we have David Pierce, who, in his hedonistic imperative, he argues that, yeah, we should abolish pain and suffering. That's a big moral duty to do. So, in the future, we're hopefully going to be able to redesign our nervous system so we can be motivated just by varying levels of pleasure, not pain. And then, once we've done that, we should also give it all to, uh, all to the animals. But now imagine one of his very, very happy post-humans and try to put him into prison. He's just going to notice, oh, I'm locked up. Mm, I can't do what I normally would do. Oh, I'm not feeling quite as uh, happy as I would, but I'm still happy. <laughs> In a sense, it would be impossible to induce anything negative. He maybe would uh, feel his happy form of remorse. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have stolen that space shuttle. Uh, maybe I should make it up to the, the, the. 
<clears throat> but most of the kind of negative emotion aspect of Pantheon would not be possible for such a person. Uh, that would uh, cause a bit of problems for some of these theories. Again, uh, many uh, theorists would of course say, yeah, that's a total science fiction case, except that some people are kind of trying to tinker with the neuroscience. We can't do it yet. Yet it seems like in a few years we're probably going to discover other weird aspects of neuroscience, which is really going to complicate things for the legal world. <clears throat> so generally, uh, what uh, we think this paper is going to lead to is the conclusion that either you believe these technologies are going to be around, in which case we should be starting to think now of what we should tell the lawyers and politicians, or you think that, yeah, this is a weird set of thought experiments, however, based on a lot of science, and that might actually help us understand better our theories of punishment and how to adapt uh, the things. Uh, actually, question our existing methods. Uh, why should a prison be like it is? Uh, if we think that the point of the uh, prison cell being uncomfortable, why aren't, aren't we putting itching powder in the beds? Or, as in the case during the Spanish Civil War, apparently they hired some abstract artists to make surrealistic prison cells to break down people's minds. First time our, uh, modern art has been used as a form of torture. Yeah? And we will probably say, yeah, that's kind of silly, uh, it's kind of inhumane, you shouldn't go out of your way to do, uh, make things worse for prisons. But in some prisons, of course, people are encouraged to learn yoga and uh, meditate, which makes things better for them. If you meditate enough, a prison might uh, be just like a monastery. In which case, it might actually be good for you. <laughs> uh, but not in the intended way as a punishment. So there are some interesting things going on here about this aversive experience versus <coughs> what right. They don't seem to actually mesh with each other at all. So, Thank you for uh, listening, and uh, I hope we have some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I'd like to link, also uh, pick up one thing that you said at the end, that maybe all of these new sort of strange thought experiments about new scientific um, stuff that we've come up with all the time, maybe that can sort of lead us to question our old theories and lead us to sort of better realize our intuitions about. So has that, have you sort of been able to use that yourself? And have you sort of, since starting to think about these different issues involving new science and so on, have, do you feel that your view of maybe what the right to the theory of punishment is, has, has that changed? Or have you sort of just found new explanations that maybe the original ideas here? Uh, I must admit that I'm kind of confused by punishment from the start because I don't know what justice is. That lady, I have no clue what she's up to. Uh, this is of course the problem of being around the philosophy department because if you ask around you're going to get very uh, convincing and very different answers. Uh, but generally I find that, yeah, I don't like the retributivist set of theories. Mostly because I'm a consequentialist. I think the consequences matter. And intentions, although they affect what kind of consequences are likely, generally they're not that important. So I generally don't find the retribution theories very convincing. And this is fairly common on this side of the Atlantic. Americans, uh, if you go to actually fear, uh, fear ethics of punishment on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you will find that it's written by a retributivist who's crowing more or less that, oh yes, we won. Retributus is the only valid theory. Yeah, yeah. That wouldn't have been written by somebody from you. Uh, of course, in Scandinavia, we would uh, immediately say, no, 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 rehabilitation, rehabilitation, and more rehabilitation. And maybe if we're feeling a bit nasty, yeah, incapacitation too, some people actually should be locked up. In practice, of course, we have this model in between. So I started to appreciate that a lot of things we do are done for several reasons that overlap, and quite often you don't tease them apart very well. Uh, and that uh, is typical for most real society. Of course, philosophical thought experiment can neatly separate them all and uh, come up with whatever system works with the thought expert, but that typically is not useful in the courtroom or telling a politician. Uh, so I'm mostly thinking about some small practicalities in the penal system that this might affect. Yeah? I, I was really intrigued by the description of surrealistic prisons um, <laughs> in the Spanish Civil War. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the use of uh, Barney cartoons to uh, sort of torture prisoners at Guantanamo, uh, about the ethics or the efficacy mm. of that. Uh, well, torture itself seems to, if you think that, the problem here is, of course, at Guantanamo, 
they're not uh, punished uh, in, legally in, uh, by the Barney cartoons. Instead, it's intended to help interrogate them. Except that most of the Guantanamo people by now, of course, have actually no extra information. So what's actually going on is a kind of just institutional maliciousness, which is problematic uh, because you want to root uh, that out. Because even if you're a really harsh retributivist, you actually don't want the institutions to be just malicious. You want them to be just. Uh, so the Barney cartoons are kind of interesting because it's a stimuli that many people, at least children, would say, yeah, that's not bad, but some people might be deeply upset about it. Uh, one interesting example I didn't bring up here is people who have claustrophobia. To them, a prison sentence is much worse than somebody who likes being locked up. And uh, we've been trying to actually tra to track down what do the penal systems do about people uh, who are afraid of being locked up and uh, have claustrophobia. It seems like in some cases, uh, although they get the same sentence as everybody else, then the prison, prison authorities actually give them a bit leeway. They, they might be having, uh, are being allowed to have a cell door open more often. There are various constructs and agreements. But that's not kind of part of the sentencing, which currently ignores it. But you could imagine a sentence that could actually calculate exactly how bad you would feel if you went to prison of a certain kind and kind of fine-tune it. So the judge checked, okay, yes, this should be 14.75 years in this case. Uh, but Barney cartoons are extra tricky because that's so individual depending on what you think about the culture. Uh, I could imagine some prisoners being rather delighted by the idea. I can imagine some jihadists being really deeply annoyed by the Barney cartoons. As a follow-up to that, do you think uh, punishments are likely to get more individualised in that sense? Where I mean, you're describing the, some almost like a room 101, where the judge is designing some bespoke sort of incarceration environment, which is yeah. much more appropriate. Uh, so, so the problem here is the reason we don't do it right now is that it seems to be too arbitrary. The judgment of the judge is actually not very exact, and we do recognize that it's very hard to estimate how people will react to different situations, mostly because we, we ourselves are not very good at telling how we will react to a situation. Uh, so I think many of these individualizations are further into the future than we might think. We might be getting some of the elementary tools, but it's going to be hard to validate and test them. They need to be reliable and they need to be valid to actually judge how people react. Uh, but to some degree, we're already seeing this, at, at least attempts of using it in the courtroom where people bring in brain scans, although a lot of that uh, is fr from a logical and moral and uh, legal perspective, probably not to go to cut it. But uh, since we can do brain scans and kind of decode people's dreams to some extent, we can do various uh, more advanced forms of brain scans, probably to tell a bit about the motivational state. It's not implausible that we end up eventually at the point where Fairly reliably, you could tell that what kind of a punishment would work. And I think uh, that will probably happen, especially if you can save money from it. And let's see. You and then you. Yeah. Uh, if, it's, if it was possible with future technology to just rehabilitate a person, to intervene in their mind and change their minds so that they didn't want to use crimes anymore, surely it would be possible for them to do the opposite to themselves. To, D rehabilitation <laughs> afterwards. So surely you either have to ban a very wide range of interventions for personal use, so that people don't turn themselves into psychopaths or something, or you just abandon rehabilitation altogether. That depends on what goes into rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is typically not just turning on some emotions, which the psychopath example is in a sense making things easy for us because it's a, probably a fairly basic neuroscientific aspect of it. Uh, however, if I you know, come from a criminal background, I don't have a respect for other people and uh, their possession, and I get rehabilitated, that means learning a lot about other people, how society works, how I might work. It's a lot of information. The rehabilitation would in that case be kind of overcoming or ignoring that information. And that seems very different. However, there are interesting cases where criminals might actually be using a form of uh, de-rehabilitative enhancement. Uh, there have been some claims, uh, actually in some uh, Swedish criminology journals, I haven't been able to track down the evidence that this was actually happened for real, but some criminals, before going on a violent spree, have been taking raw hypnol, which uh, kind of dulled uh, a little bit of their thinking and uh, allowed them afterwards to claim that they couldn't remember what they're doing. 
So this is a bit unclear whether they actually did it because yeah, they just wanted to get high or mellow, or whether they actually felt, hmm, I want to go out and uh, do a clockwork orange uh, violence spree. Let's uh, do, put myself in the right mood for that. Now, we might even argue that in the later case, this might be much worse. If somebody is drunk and does something uh, immoral or stupid, he still got the excuse that he was drunk. We might say uh, if he has a history of uh, doing bad stuff while drunk, that he has a moral uh, reason not to get drunk in the first place. Uh, and similarly, if you know that you're going to get violent if drunk, then you have a very strong reason not to, and we should probably give a harsher punishment. Uh, now, I'm not entirely certain uh, that these raw hypno guzzling uh, wannabe clockwork orange boys <laughs> actually exist. Uh, because the argument, it also feels to be part a bit of a uh, kind of co Swedish anti drug complex, trying to find any argument against allowing people to take dr any drugs, and of course, cracking down even harshly against misuse of medications. So, in, in, in the case of misuse of medication, we see that, yeah, it's practically impossible to prevent even for rather serious ones. So I think, yes, people are going to misuse a lot of these technologies, but I don't think it's likely that we're going to be misused, most of the, these ones, to such an extent that you need to ban them in a, for their normal formal uses. Okay, you had a question and you had a question. It was almost the same as okay. what you just asked. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, do you think that uh, when like, uh, some, some methods of enhancement become very popular, for example, life extension, uh, do you think that people will not kind of fundamentally change their mindsets in a way that might make it for them more difficult to perform a crime just because, in a way, they will, have, uh, they will regard themselves with more respect as a species? And in a way, for example, I, I don't know uh, what is the reason for many people performing crimes today, but maybe they just kind of uh, maybe there are cases of crimes performed, uh, like, like in um, the crime and punishment when uh, the, the guy kills the woman because and his uh, excuses for himself is that she was too old to die anyway. So that's an interesting question. So Steven Pinker has this argument that we become much more peaceful over both historical time and recently. <coughs> And uh, in a sense, of course, as we get a more lonely in society, it's getting much more peaceful because there are fewer teenagers. This uh, is a major thing because if you look at the crime statistics, of course, uh, typically it's young males that do a lot of the crimes. So if there are fewer, fewer young males compared to the overall population, you're going to get a more law abiding society, probably just out of that. With the fact that you're also kind of going to have a longer life and a longer life might be worth more is affecting people's thinking. That's a bit more subtle. I think where Pinker kind of has a strong argument uh, is that, yeah, we also develop better police systems and better formal regulations that actually allow our society to be more law abiding. And you're more likely to get caught if you commit a crime now than in the Middle Ages. Uh, but I think there is also something to it that we have a more long-term oriented society. Uh, you actually expect to live it until you're 80 or so. Most of us. It's worth noticing that the people who tend to commit crime generally have a very steep time discounting. They don't care that much about the future. Again, uh, you could probably argue that maybe we should fine-tune the discount factor a little bit. It might have a real neurological basis. There are some interesting uh, studies about how certain drugs and hormones change people's risk-taking behavior. And maybe the proper thing would be to tune it up. But again, that might also be problematic from an authenticity perspective, because some people might say, but I am a daredevil. If I'm stopping a daredevil, I'm not me. You have no right to actually turn me into somebody else, even though that person would probably have a long and a happy life without breaking any laws. And the problem might be, of course, that the daredevil person might also not care about uh, the long-run consequences of being a daredevil. So very interesting problems here, but I think that we have a general tend to us being much, much more long-term oriented. We might be decrying that our institutions tend to have a very short time span of just one or two years, but we ourselves, we actually expect to live for most part of a century. We should expect the company we're working for uh, to go under long before uh, we die. The average lifespan of a company is about five to seven years, I seem to recall. So uh, working for one company over a lifetime, that's kind of relatively rare. Indeed, my uh, grandmother, she's 103 years old, she outlasted the Soviet Union. 
kind of an awesome thought uh, about that. And that does give some perspective. Still, her political views are also mildly antediluvian, which is kind of an interesting complication. <laughs> So it might be that, yes, in the future we're going to be very long-term oriented, and then we're going to have a problem with a 200-year-old judge still implementing uh, some legal, do legal thinking and ethical thinking that was really popular in the progressive 2020s. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. Uh, I just I think the happiness and intelligence questions are kind of separate from each other. Uh, I think humanness has a lot more to do with your motivational uh, abilities. Uh, so being super intelligent, you might still be very human, uh, but uh, you can think things uh, that the other humans around you can't possibly think. But you can still do the kind of simple thinking. Uh, it's a bit like playing with a child, maybe. I think the happiness part is more interesting because somebody with a very different motivational or emotional system might indeed not fit in our definition. However, from an ethics standpoint, I think we would say, yeah, what really matters is whether you are a moral agent. Should you regard you as a person? And uh, even the sociopath might uh, be arguing uh, from his chair in ethics that, uh, of, of course, uh, the, we sociopaths, we should be regarded uh, uh, as part of a natural neurodiversity too. Just like the Asperger's people or even the neurotypicals. Uh, so uh, myself, I'm a very happy person. I'm, uh, my mood set point is way up and I'm having a hard time feeling bad about stuff, which is downright embarrassing at funerals. Now, would I be better off if I could get really depressed occasionally? I don't really want that. I think I, I, it would be useful if I could move a little bit more in my emotional range, but it doesn't seem to stop me from interacting with humans most of the time. Uh, I think there might be other aspects that are important for our ability to function as humans. So I think to some extent the empathy and, and, and sympathy part might actually be necessary. I'm not entirely convinced psychopaths uh, fit into the moral agent uh, perspective. They might actually not quite be part of our set. We're very close to it. And uh, maybe we can nudge them over the border and then we can accept their quirks. But the, the, it might get very tricky, of course, if you really enhance something. No more question. Oh yes. Just uh, so I read that recently, there's been some studies of depression that showed that depression is actually adaptive for working through really really tough situations in some cases. Uh, just randomly, do you find being permanently happy? I kind of feel like the same, the same way most of the time is uh, and it, uh, is now adapted to certain situations. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, there is some evidence that bipolar disorder is correlated with some forms of artistic or mathematical creativity. And it might be that, yeah, during the depressive phase, you're actually mulling through the problems, although you're feeling really bad. And then, as you get more energy, you can start working. And then maybe during the manic phase, you're not doing anything useful, but uh, uh, at least you got something done when you were in the right range. The problem is, of course, that it's not, the point about living is not just to be productive in a sense, it's actually having a life that's worth living. And the depressive people, uh, you know, although they might have lives worth living, they're still above zero, they could be so much better. And if, you could, uh, sac if we have to sacrifice some insights uh, for that, I still think it's worthwhile. But it might be useful to try to get that thing, maybe actually deliberately giving yourself a kind of therapeutic depression to work through a problem. I'm, I'm going to spend an autumn being melancholic and try to think about ethics. Maybe that would be good for me. If, and it, I think it would be good if it was a, a choice I could make, rather than something my brain chemistry has decided, <laughs> oh yes, let's do, uh, decrease the serotonin levels. Why? Why not? <laughs> Uh, similar depressives also are a bit more realistic in their expectations of uh, what will happen and uh, how can, uh, thi well things will work out. Most of us are actually too optimistic. Uh, so they are more realistic. So you should have one depressive guy on any uh, committee but trying to uh, decide things. But again, the downside is they're feeling bad. 
So we want depression without feeling bad. <laughs> yeah? If it's immoral to keep someone in prison for a thousand years because they'll be a different person when they come out, is it immoral to punish someone for something they did a thousand years ago that you didn't find out about? And um, would it be better to keep regular backups of people and wake up their old backup and punish the old backup? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea, actually. Uh, yeah. uh, so, so I think the thousand year time is interesting. Uh, the reason we have uh, this, um, what's the English term again? Uh, uh, the, li the limit um, after which you can be punished by a crime. Statute of limitations. Yeah, lim yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 this limit is there for a reason. The, the real reason is actually not that you have become a different person. It's mainly, oh, witnesses are going to have bad memories. That was the original reason. But the statute of limitations only applies to certain types. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is the fun part. It was introduced because it's obvious that witnesses will forget things over time. And since we have no way of recording information other than witnesses, uh, that's what we and then, of course, people were outraged because murder, you shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Okay, no with the statute of limitations uh, for murder. So it got removed for a, a lot of things. Uh, but I think there is also some truth to that. There are some crimes that are relatively minor and go, trying to go back you know, far enough. No, the, you have changed enough. Uh, what people did as teenagers, even if we figure it out now, uh, you shouldn't be punishing them for it. Partially because uh, it might have been minor things, partially because their brains were already kind of different. I mean, teenage brains, they're not accountable at all. <laughs> <laughs> and you can even show that to some extent. You can see that orbital frontal cortex is actually still haven't matured completely, which is kind of interesting, mildly disturbing, because uh, still a lot of teenagers are around, allowed to vote, and allowed to handle these really dangerous to call cars. <laughs> But I do like the backup idea. I think there is a problem. Once you had to, uh, activated the backup copy and punished him, what do you do with him now? You're not allowed to kill him. So, now you have two of uh, the criminal. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Okay, so, uh, let's uh, restaurants serving Mediterranean cuisine. Oh yeah, and there will be an awesome talk on Friday yeah. by David Wood on anticipating uh, 2025. He's the organizer of the big event in London. He will be giving like a brief overview and giving like best things to watch out for. Just totally come. Yeah. And on Wednesday next week we will be having the awesome Sean O'Hare day. That is that how you pronounce his name? Sean O'Hagerty. Nobody can spell his name. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll I'll it. Well, and he will be talking on. I guess it was catastrophic <laughs> risk. Oh yeah, uh, diversity, uh, scientific diversity in global in the research of global catastrophic risk. Yeah, Sean is also from the Future of Humanity Institute. Yeah, um, he's really cool. <laughs> yeah, we have we have very excellent talks for me now yeah. and next Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should also make uh, some little advertisement about uh, the James Martin School. Uh, so we still have a few talks uh, left here. Uh, we have uh, census everywhere on sixth of March: trends and challenges for accurate indoor localization. If you want to have even more cameras, mm -hmm. and on the 13th of March, my colleague Carl Frey um, will talk about replace by robots, the challenge and opportunity for automation of the workforce. So that's over at the market school. Finally, if you feel like becoming a committee member, talk to the president. And we have some food. Feel free to eat some. Yeah. Yeah.